We are now flying over some of the wilderness areas of northwestern United States and Canada. Here there are thousands of square miles of uninhabited wilderness that is still unexplored. It is in these vast, unexplored wilderness areas of North America that a nine-foot-tall, human-like creature is reported to live. This is the home of the Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, as the Indians call him. I'm Jay Smith, and it's my job to give you a first-hand report on Bigfoot. I've been here in this camp for several days. We're told it's Bigfoot country. From this camp, a vast wilderness area is now being searched for the Bigfoot. This is Ron Olson. Ron's from Springfield, Oregon, and he heads up expeditions looking for the Bigfoot. Ron, tell me, just what is a Bigfoot? Craig. Hold that thing up a minute. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, as he's called in Canada, is a giant, hair-covered, human-like creature that's been reported more and more throughout the mountains of the northwestern United States and Canada. How big do they run? Many sightings have revealed this creature to be between 7 to 9 feet tall and 600 to 900 pounds. Well, well now, Let's hear the words of some people who have had some first-hand experiences with Bigfoot. In 1924, Fred Beck and four other miners were in a cabin in the backwoods located in Washington State near St. Helens. There were four or five creatures who approached the cabin during the night and proceeded to harass the miners by throwing rocks and pounding on the walls and doors of the cabin. You know, they was big, big shoulders and small hips and hairy, and it was, i call them a black turned brown by the sun, outside hair. That's what I would tell, call them to be. And muscular. And it looked like they were about eight, nine foot tall. I no way to tell. Another miner and prospector, Albert Ostman, in 1924 was camped near Toba Inlet in British Columbia. While asleep in a sleeping bag, he was picked up and packed several miles. Daylight found him in a small valley encircled by cliffs. This was home for a family of these creatures. He was able to escape after six days by getting them sick on a box of snuff. Now let's listen to Mr. Osman's experience. Well, uh, there was four of them, and uh, yeah, none of them looked alike. There was uh, what I call the old men, because I had no scale or any rules for measurement, but he was at least eight feet tall, and must have had at least 800 pounds. Uh, but the, the, what I call the old lady, she, uh, she couldn't have been over about six, 700 pounds. She was probably uh, seven feet tall, and uh, uh, they were all covered with hair. By 1956, there had been several such reported sightings, which had been reported in small local newspapers. Mr. John Green, publisher of a newspaper at Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia, began investigating some of these sightings. Here is John Green to report on a sighting he investigated in 1957. When I first came here in 
about 1957, it was still pretty well open. But all this has, has grown up since then. Now, uh, what happened at that time was that uh, Mrs. George Chapman, who lived in a house down by the river behind me here, uh, she was in the house and the children were outside. One of them came in and told her that there was a cow coming out of the woods. So she looked out and she saw this man-like thing, but uh, about eight feet tall and completely covered with hair like a bear. And uh, she knew it to be a Sasquatch. Uh, this was you know, quite a well-known thing to the Indian people. And she was frightened, so she took the children, ran down to the river, and then through the graveyard, which is right behind me here, and uh, came out just about here onto the track, and then uh, ran on down to Ruby Creek. Now, uh, she'd really only had one quick look at the thing, so uh, it wouldn't be that convincing a story, except that a lot of people immediately went back there and saw these enormous tracks. Uh, Mr. Tifting, uh, of course, was one of them, and uh, can describe uh, just what the tracks were like and what they did. Well, he came through the bush into the shed, or the lean-to of the house, and there was a barrel of dried fish or smoked salmon rodder, and he broke the barrel, and there was some fish eaten there and thrown around, and then he went down the river bank and apparently took a drink, and then come back up on the other side of the house, through the garden patch, and up to CPR fence, and step with one foot on that side of the fence, and one foot on this side of the fence. I can walk right over it. And, and the footprints was about 18 inches, like. And then he went across there and over to the next fence there and went right up the hillside. And that's as far as we could follow it, see. As John Green and others began to seriously investigate reported sightings, they found that many aspects of the sightings were the same. One of the first detailed drawings of a Sasquatch was made by Mrs. Myrtle Walton of British Columbia. Her father, William Rowe, had the unique experience of being able to watch a Sasquatch at close range. Mrs. Walton now tells us how it came about. My dad come and asked me to draw a picture of this animal or human for him. He called it a Sasquatch. So he could uh, send it to this John Green and uh, I draw the picture for him and just exactly the way he told me he wanted to draw. There was a few things he changed on it. Like the, he made the arms a lot heavier and the head was different and the breast was different and the back part was different. So we, between the two of us, we patched it all up and we sent it to John Green. As the interested investigators became better known, there were more and more sightings and evidences being submitted to them. Mr. Richard Grover, another investigator, reports on a sighting in a residential area just outside of Tacoma, Washington. This is the site of the Fife Heights incident. One morning, approximately 4 o'clock, Dick Hancock and his friend came along this road, stopping the car right here when they saw a huge creature behind that sign over there. It was so tall, its head was above the street sign. The creature took approximately three steps, crossing the road. It was blinded by the headlights, and it almost bumped into this sign. As it sidestepped, it caught this sign before it went down over the hill. This is the sign that the creature struck, and it bent it like this, leaving these indentations or scratch marks. It has been estimated by experts that it took 500 foot-pounds to bend this material. A few years after Mrs. Walton made the sketch for her father, she and her husband had a personal experience with a Bigfoot. This is what they report. Well, I think my wife and I have heard the Sasquatch. There's a swamp fairly close to the house here where we can walk out uh, of an evening. and Quite often we go down to watch moose. And uh, one night we were down there and uh, 
there wasn't any moose around, which was strange because in the summer every night there's moose in the swamp. And uh, it was just before dusk when across the swamp uh, we heard this screaming cry. There were three cries, screams, or horrible screams or whatever they was. One after the other, there was silence between and everything was just dead quiet afterwards. Just made the hair crawl on the back of your neck. We didn't see anything, but I've heard uh, every animal that lives in the locality at different times, and uh, it wasn't any of those. And uh, mm. If I was asked to describe the sound, I'd say uh, it was a kind of a screaming cry, and it seemed to have anguish in it. I'd, anguish was the thing that uh, stuck with me. Here is an approximation to the sound that they reported hearing that evening. <laughs> Some of the investigators began to call on the scientific community for facts which might put the puzzle together and prove or disprove the reports. Here is Dr. Charles Giguet, curator of mammals at the Provincial Museum in Victoria, British Columbia, who reflects the dilemma in which he and his companions found themselves. In my opinion, the Sasquatch, the Yeti, the abominable snowman, the Winnego, the Catabrosaurus, Loch Ness Monster, Ogopogo, all of these uh, animals belong in the realm of folklore and mythology. And my reason for saying this is simply that there is no concrete proof, evidence, that any of these creatures ever existed on the face of this planet. No one has ever produced a specimen, complete or incomplete, to prove that any of these animals have ever lived. The scientists were asking for physical evidence to support the stories of the reported creature. In 1958, Gerald Crew was building a new road in a wilderness area in Northern California. For several mornings in a row, he noted there were huge human-like footprints around his bulldozer. He obtained some plaster of Paris and made casts of them. Here now was physical evidence of something that made tracks. Some scientists say they are made by a prankster. Here is another investigator, Rene Dahinden. No scientist ever came out in the bush to look at the footprints which we found. No scientists ever studied these tracks. They are sitting there saying they are faked without ever having seen a footprints in the area where we found them. No technical evaluation was ever made. In my opinion, after having seen 3,000 footprints myself of six different sizes, I came to the conclusion this tracks to be made by a living foot, a creature with a foot like this, a Sasquatch, rather than a man with artificial feet. The task of the investigator has not been an easy one. On one hand, he is greeted by individuals who just saw Bigfoot and believes it. On the other, he is met with cries of derision and fakery. There is beginning to be a new line of thinking from the scientific community on this subject. Here is Dr. Grover Krantz, physical anthropologist at Washington State University, which explains his view. As a physical anthropologist, I've uh, decided that uh, these creatures do, in all likelihood, exist. <clears throat> the uh, evidence of the footprints is what I find the most convincing. This is an example of one footprint. This is a plaster cast, which shows a crippled individual. The foot was twisted, and two bulges appear, calloused structures on the outside edge of the foot, and correspond to gaps in the bones which I've reconstructed here. If this was faked, the person doing it had to be an absolute expert in human anatomy. Perhaps the most startling and far-reaching event in the recent history of Bigfoot hunting happened to a longtime investigator by the name of Roger Patterson. In October of 1967, he and a friend were in the Bluff Creek area of Northern California to investigate a reported sighting of two creatures. Suddenly his horse shied as a large creature stood erect from behind a log where it had been drinking from the creek. Patterson grabbed a 16-millimeter camera from the saddlebag and jumped from the back of the rearing horse 
to take the following pictures. Let's hear, in Patterson's words, exactly what happened that day. As it, uh, as I walked across the sand floor, I was able to get uh, uh, some fairly good footage of it. It turned uh, a couple of times and looked at us. And as it, uh, as it turned, uh, uh, it seemed to give me the impression that it didn't want uh, anything to do with us. It didn't run. It didn't uh, act scared, but yet it acted leery of us. Patterson thought that he had proved once and for all that the creatures existed. But he found that even the film was in question. As a result, the footage was submitted to experts in various fields. <laughs> Among them was Janos Prohaska. Active in the motion picture industry since 1939 as an impersonator of animals of the ape family, Mr. Prohaska was convinced that Roger Patterson had filmed a living wild creature. The movement is the only thing that throwed me a little bad, because he moved a little bit more than a man, more like a man than an animal. Because you could see all the muscles on the body and the whole movement. It didn't move like a costume at all. And the size of it was enormous big size, so I don't know if they find a big man like that. Uh, Mr. Prohoshka, you mentioned that the creature did not move as if it were a costume. Do you think it would be possible to create such a costume? Uh, that would be a difficult... I don't think so. Because that costume, if it would be a costume that would have taken such a long time to put the, the hair, you should put the hair by glue, glue them on. That would take about 10 hours, the whole makeup job. And it looked to me very, very real. I'm doing all this since 1939, and... Uh, if that was a costume, that was the best I have ever seen. Ron Olson of the North American Wildlife Research Association has studied the Patterson footage as much as anyone. Ron, what did you see in this footage? Well, this footage proved to me that these creatures are real and that they do exist. Now, how tall would you estimate that one to be? This creature was estimated by scientific methods, uh, to be about seven and a half to eight feet tall. He was taking a stride of about 47 inches to 65. After he became spooked or more scared, he stretched to 65. Now, how does the length of that stride compare to, well, let's say the average stride of a man? Well, the average stride of a man is about, maximum stride of a man would be about three feet. Now, that arm appears to be proportionately longer than, say, a human arm. Uh, have there been any estimates worked out on that? Yes, there has. Uh, the arm is, and always has been in all sightings, in all cases, uh, definitely longer than a human's. Here the creature shows large pendulous breasts. The indication here, of course, is that it is a female creature. Do you expect to capture one of these? Well, this is, of course, our I suppose you'd call the finale of our whole program is to make a capture. We want to make a live capture, and with this, uh, we are using tranquilizing equipment. We hope to bring one of these things in with a live capture, live and unharmed, to prove once and for all that, that this does exist. And since it does exist, maybe then there can be laws and things passed to protect these creatures so that they'll never become extinct. In the past two years, there has been a new undertaking by all concerned investigators to consolidate all of their data. All new sightings are investigated and reported on a lengthy questionnaire. Then this information is programmed into a computer. These computer reports and correlations are available to all of the participating investigators upon request. In this way, each investigator can carry on his own work with a much more complete source of data. Along with the computer reports, the most modern equipment is now being used, as it is here in this camp. Procedures have been worked out to cover every aspect of a capture. In the past, many sightings went unreported for fear of ridicule. Law enforcement officers got most of these reported sightings and most of the people that did the reporting were considered well, some kind of a nut. Now a central reporting system has been developed 
and all sightings can now be reported to our Portland headquarters by simply dialing Bigfoot, Portland, Oregon. Other information can be obtained by writing Bigfoot, Portland, Oregon. It was inevitable that sooner or later these sightings and observations would result in something specific. That someday someone would come forth to try to prove or disprove once and for all the validity of these stories. One Bob Morgan decided to take on the task. It's late spring when Bob Morgan arrives at Cougar, Washington to renew his search for Sasquatch. After five years' research, he feels this is a prime area for contacting the creature. Others will be coming from all corners of the United States to aid in the search. Don Blake, biologist. Layman Hardy, botanist. Anne Swain, sociology researcher. Michael Polesnik, expert tracker. Elizabeth Mormon, naturalist. Anthropologist, Peter Lipsio. Ted Ernst, Sasquatch researcher. John Crowder, biologist. Len Aiken, woodsman and Indian historian. Mary Jo Flory, microbiologist. For the next three and a half months, this diversified group of scientists and researchers will live and work in the woods, gathering evidence, looking for tracks, and trying to establish contact with a creature who some call the American Abominable Snowman. They'll scout alone at times, or work in small groups from field tents located at strategic positions in the wilderness. Keeping it all together is Robert Morgan, who will split his time between base camp and the field positions. I hope you understand, I didn't come out here to win friends and influence people. Now, I may be wrong in what I do, but it's all for one purpose, and that is to get the job done. By his own definition, Morgan's a tough, hard-driving man who can't rest until he's gotten the job done. An early riser, you'll often see him working late into the night. He's tough because he has to be. It's the key to survival in this mountain wilderness. What gives Morgan his drive? Why is he so persistent in his search for something which others say doesn't exist? What keeps him going in the face of unrelenting ridicule and unfavorable odds? There can be no other explanation than his own personal encounter with Bigfoot 20 years ago. It was in these woods that Morgan found himself face to face with a giant. Well, it all began for me in March of 1957 when I was uh, hunting uh, in Mason County, Washington. I saw a creature there, came face to face with it. The most man-like looking gorilla I'd ever seen. This is how I described it because I didn't know. I'd never heard of Bigfoot, never heard of Sasquatch, the Omaha, or the Yeti. I, I had never heard of any of that. And all of a sudden, I came face to face with this creature, about 40 yards away, I guess he was. And he had the most m knowing, knowing look on his face, his eyes. I remember the eyes, I think, more than anything else. And then I discovered, much to my surprise and shock and dismay, when I tried to report it, it was treated as though it was, it was a hoax, as if it were a joke. This creature does exist. It's here. It's all around us. We can learn from it. And yet modern science has turned its back on it. They don't want to know about it. Now, that, uh, that makes me madder than hell. We are told that giants live only in storybooks and dreams. If this is the case, then a lot of people have had the same dream about Sasquatch.
stories and legends of the creature date back hundreds, if not thousands of years among American Indians. Masks, tribal rites and rituals have been dedicated to the creature. And he's known by a hundred different names. Siatik, Oma, Bushman, Skookum, Wild Man, Sunaqua, Bigfoot. By any name, his description comes out the same. The creature is large, very large, standing eight feet tall and weighing nearly 800 pounds. He's muscular, has little or no neck, and is bipedal, which means he walks upright, like man on two legs. The tracks he leaves behind tell the story. Like the creature, they are big, some over 18 inches long and eight inches wide. The footprints show five toes and an imprint like any one of us would leave, except for the size. They are nothing like a bear's track. Sasquatch is apparently flat-footed and walks with a four-foot stride with his knees slightly bent. Each hand of the giant primate has five fingers, but he doesn't have an opposing thumb, indicating he cannot grasp small objects the way we can. Little else is known for sure. Bigfoot is thought to be semi-nomadic, following a trail of food which is quite variable. Berries, grass, seed, fruits, even small rodents, fish and insects. Other questions remain. Is he dangerous? Would he attack a human? While he is generally believed to be non-aggressive, these thoughts have certainly occurred to more than one expedition member, including Morgan. Do I have any fear? Of course I have fear. But what the hell is worth doing in this world if it doesn't have a price to pay? In my own instance, I have been in the close proximity of Bigfoot and I have not been attacked. I am alive. I feel that he had every opportunity in the world to kill me on many occasions. And they have not chosen to do so. I have respect for this creature, but I don't fear him per se. mountain ranges of the Pacific Northwest are beautiful and awesome. If giants like Sasquatch do exist, this area would make ideal living quarters. There's enough wilderness left between Northern California and British Columbia to harbor a sizable population of the creatures. In Washington alone, there are millions of unexplored, uncharted acres. It's big country, where distance is measured in time rather than miles and where even man must fight for survival. The territory is made up of dense forest, tangled brush, and rough terrain. And a few steps off the trail, anyone, including a large creature, is swallowed by the forest. The trees and underbrush provide such good shelter that you rarely see any animals. But the animals are here. You can feel their presence. You can follow their tracks if you're skilled. And there, among the tracks of elk, wolves, and wildcat, are the gigantic human-like footprints of Sasquatch, and they cannot be denied. Tracks that give monster stories credibility. The forests of the Pacific Northwest have been claimed by the loggers, but where the logging roads have not reached, where the bulldozers not swathed a path, the country remains as it was thousands of years ago, an untamed frontier. One such area is of particular interest to Morgan. He wants it scouted for future exploration. In the expedition, 
Only one man has any chance of entering this rugged, cheerless territory and returning safely. The call goes to Mike Polesnik, an authority on surviving in the woods. He will go alone. Okay, Mike, here's what the situation is. As you know, this area, as far as I know, uh, according to the people who live around here, has never been crossed. They, they hunt the peripheries. Uh, one guy, as far as we know, goes up a uh, short distance up this stream in order to fish, but they don't go in here. But the problem is, you see, the logging areas have have surrounded this area. It's, it's kind of a, you know, uh, an oasis. So I've been wanting to go in here for two years. Yeah, five days. Use your own time, use your own judgment. And the important thing is there's no possible way of radio contact or anything else. You're, you're on your own. And uh, all I can tell you is be careful. All right, if I get onto anything, I'll go ahead and stay right on it until I get a positive ID or establish communications in some form. If you're having problems, put up a flare, right. okay? And uh, we'll, you know, take a bearing on that, okay? Mm -hmm. That's it, my friend. You got all your gear? How much food do you have? Five days. That's it. To the casual observer, the area where Mike is headed appears tame and inviting. But an experienced woodsman like Mike knows that staying alert means staying alive. There's so much to be done in such little time. Morgan keeps the expedition going at an accelerated pace. With Polesnik on his way, he and Ted Ernst set out to explore the lava flows of Mount St. Helens, once an active volcano. They'll spend the first day together. Then Ted, like Mike, will be on his own. Wherever he goes, Morgan is constantly reminded that he is the visitor, the intruder in Bigfoot's territory. In his element, he is king. We are the invaders. He has no fear, builds no cities. He violates everything that we have stood for. He belongs with this earth. He belongs here. He lives with nature. We, unfortunately, live in spite of it. He's part of nature. We create our own air conditioning, Neon lights, one-way streets, parking meters. Good Lord. We must carry food on our back. We have to eat specialized diets. We have to have this, we have to have that. We have a high fatigue factor, etc., etc., etc. Hell, he doesn't carry a pack. And this creature walks along God's world as if he's one of them. And he leaves very little behind him except tracks. It's kind of sad that we are in pursuit of a creature that lives so beautifully with nature. Perhaps, just perhaps, we can learn from him. Morgan receives a phone call from a logger named Skip Wood. Good Lord, a six foot That was a six-foot stride, huh? Turned While clear-cutting acreage in Washougal sure. County, mm -hmm. yeah. Wood and several others were visited by a large, hairy animal. You haven't lost any loggers The creature, today, matching Bigfoot's description, uh, no watched the lumbermen from a rock clearing above their camp. And they watched it for four hours. Uh, th this is very intriguing because the uh, oh, this is the second report now we've had in within two months of uh, cat logging 
and having the creatures come near, you know, uh, loggers at, during the day, which is extremely unusual. Now, be en route within, uh, within the hour. Thank you so very much. We'll get underway, and I appreciate very much your call. Have a nice day. Bye. Hot report. Day before yesterday. Reports similar to Skipwood's have been on the increase in recent years as civilization creeps deeper into the forest. They're not just limited to the Pacific Northwest. The skunk ape of Florida, the bush monster of Idaho, the Sunaqua of Canada, the Yeti of the Himalayas, all bear a striking resemblance to Bigfoot. Could it be that these creatures are cousins, members of an evolutionary strain unknown to modern man? And does it roam these woods with bear and other wild animals? Morgan wants to find out. It's half a day's drive from Cougar to Washougal County over rough terrain and washed out roads. When the expedition group arrives, Wood is eager to tell them about the unwelcome visitor. Now this happened last Friday. Yeah, Friday. What, what happened? Again. Well, this happened to see one climbing up the hillside there. And it was going all the way up that bluff? Yeah, it started out there in that little hole I showed you there. And went hand over hand or hand over foot, however you describe him climbing. Stayed up at the top and stood up there and watched it. And uh, your whole crew was down here, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. There was... Um, yeah, there was Chuck Owens. Skip told me, the, our boss, told me that... Uh, or said that there was something climbing up on the mountain up there, and so I turned around and looked. And Leo Casey and Bob Irwin. I just saw a steady thing standing there. It looked like maybe a tree waving in the wind a little bit. All I could see was a big black glob. Dark, that's all I could tell you. Do you see the uh, outline distinct so that it was definitely walking on two hind legs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it just, it was standing out there. I mean, it was too big for a bear, and bears don't walk on hind legs unless they're fighting anyway. And that would be my logical explanation for it, was that it was a bear. Well, the way it went up the mountain, the way everybody describes Bigfoot, that's the only thing I can think of was, because a bear just don't do, do things like that. And you've had a feeling around this camp since you moved in here? Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can feel them watching there. Only, only thing, when I first started to work here, I'd look at that mountain and I knew I didn't want to be around it because it was just that uh, I knew something was there or something was watching me all the time. But I look up there all the time now because I expect to see it again someday. Hmm, you just might. The loggers want nothing further to do with this or any other Sasquatch. So Morgan and Elizabeth Mormon set out alone for the rock face where the creature was seen. The heavy rainfall the night before has left the ground wet and slippery, making the treacherous climb even more hazardous. They must make their own trail as they go. What looked so near from below will take them six hours to reach, and they must hurry to return by dark. Reaching the summit, the pair finds little more than a spectacular view. Morgan has chased too many reports. 
followed too many leads to be discouraged. His work done here, he heads back to base camp. It's still early in the expedition. We both believe that we... Before our film crew it, arrived, expedition member it. Ann Swain had what might have been the first Sasquatch bad. sighting of the expedition. She recounts the incident. I turned to my right and I looked down at the end of the creek and as I lift my binoculars, I saw this huge black form. And I just... I just froze and, and I looked and maybe three seconds passed and I put my binoculars down. I was really excited. I didn't know what it was. I saw it. It was large and it was behind these bushes and I put them down and I called to Bob and as I put them back up to look again, it was gone. When we got into the woods, to the forest, there was uh, impressions and they were larger than even a large man would make. And it was just where the pine needles had been, it was very wet in there, had been pressed down and made wetter than the surrounding area. There's a lot of evidence in this country. There's a lot of reports. And uh, I'm thoroughly convinced there is a Bigfoot out here. Many of them, families. The group returns to Cougar in time to pick up Mike Polesnik, who's covered 20 square miles during his five-day trip alone in the woods. I got something for you. On his way out, Mike found large, barefoot, human-like tracks. It's exciting news. Coming out of the woods, next to the berries, and there's still berries on the ground. Not that long, barefoot. He's flat-footed. I, I thought they were human, but I went back on my way down. I don't think they are. Okay, how far off the road are they? It's, uh... Pretty close to the mountain. Quite a ways up? No, it's uh, it's not a long ways up. It's uh, right there where the trail begins. Can we get Pete Lipsio in there? Yeah, I need to see him. And how about up on the mountain? Oh, man. Three hours going up. Uh, a cat come in the first night. And the second night, he come in closer. And the third night, I left. <laughs> <laughs> I think he knew I was scared. <laughs> okay. Hey, did I find something? Is there something there? <laughs> All right. All right, by the way, uh, I think... Uh, Large human-like footprints on the trail in an area where Morgan suspects Bigfoot could be. This might be the breakthrough the expedition has needed. Certainly, it could mean one or more of the creatures is in the area or has been recently. The risk of sending Mike into such a dangerous place has apparently paid off. That's a good place for you. Can we eat well? Yeah, berries. Strawberries. Carry your part in there. And there's snakes. Good Lord, everywhere. Rattles? Yeah, when I, when I left the camp, I wasn't 50 feet when I left that morning. And it almost got me. <laughs> right off the road, where I left? Right on the trail. Right on the trail from camp. So the snakes are everywhere. The loggers have worked. It's dangerous because uh, the trees are sharp edges sticking up like this. If you stumble and fall, it's, it's all over. One guy could go in there and never come out. With fresh tracks to be examined, the group wastes little time back at base camp, just long enough for Mike to get a beer and doctor his feet, which blistered during his journey. Earliest reports of tracks found in these forests date back to 1811. A trapper stumbled across footprints 14 inches long and 8 inches wide. Over the last five years, Morgan has found numerous tracks in these parts. The ones Mike found are the latest in a long string of evidence Sasquatch has left behind. These particular tracks leave little doubt that something large with man-like feet has passed through here. It had to point into the woods and after that. You just couldn't pick up anything with the foliage on the ground. Pete, make your measurements. Uh, photograph, measure. We'll we photograph it up and take measure it. And let Michael pour some gifts. Mike, you, would you give anything. me a, a hand here for one second, please? Just hold on to that, okay? Very interesting. All right. Something's moved through here. These ferns are down. Okay, hold it. 
I never cease to be amazed that when I see a, a Bigfoot footprint and look at it, that I really don't realize the, the massiveness of it until I put a ruler down. And then I say, good Lord, you know, that's 16, 17, or 18 inches. You don't realize it until you put that ruler down. And consequently, if you were walking casually by, not looking for Bigfoot, and you saw barefoot footprints, you'd probably ignore them. I'm sure that it's been done many times. As a plaster record of two of the tracks is made, out, the mood of the group changes. It goes from elation over finding the prints to anxiety. Expedition members become tense, on edge. There is the sense of danger. Others who have been in the vicinity of Sasquatch have reported similar eerie feelings. The hope is that whatever made these footprints is still in the area and might return. I'll become part of the cast. If you take a walk back through this area, you're going to find a couple of things rather interesting. Number one, all the berries are gone. Number two, there is fresh and old breaks in these ferns leading all the way back up into this area. I didn't, I didn't find the end of it. I just found them. It would be senseless to send a scouting party into the surrounding woods. The tracks are now several days old, and there are too many places around here to hide. So the group heads back camp, satisfied with what they've uncovered. By early August, Morgan has gathered enough data about Bigfoot in western Washington to warrant new plans. He's convinced there are two or more families, mother, father, and one or more young, who travel a specific route through the Mount St. Helens area. Minor changes in field positions will place the researchers right along this movement route. We're going to tighten up. As you know, when we first came out here, we thought of three migratory or, or movement route patterns. We've pinned down what seems to be used now. So rather than ranging out now, it's time, I think, to move in closer. If you can't find the creature, Morgan likes to say, let the creature find you. You can do what you want during the day, you know, do your normal tracking and ranging out during the day. But in the evenings, is the, in, in the early morning hours, set your alarms and, and from pre-dawn till perhaps two or three hours after dawn, I think we should be especially aware. So I'll show you the way we're going to do this. Don, you and Layman are going to take... here. We've established four camps along a line which I feel is a movement route. When the creature goes from one wilderness area into another wilderness area, these areas are accessible. I cannot go into the total wilderness areas because we are not logistically equipped to do so. Here I'm trying to get him a little bit on my ground. Hopefully, they will either observe him in movement or the creatures will come to their camp. I ask my people to be in from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. to be awake, aware of what's going on around them. Now, I do not permit firearms in the field. I don't feel that it's necessary. I feel that if a creature like this wants you, your firearms are nothing more than an iron teddy bear, because he's going to get you. So certainly, there can be a time when this creature could be dangerous. But if you don't want to get wet, stay the hell out of the water. If you're not willing to take that chance, don't come along with me. It's as simple as that. And every one of my people, they know this, they understand it, and they accept it. Now, out of the camp, the, uh, the people will rove during the day. And they go within certain areas that I've assigned. 
and they rove around and uh, the biologist and botanist are doing their job, which is an updating, constant updating. I'm getting a constant update of what food is available, what succulents are available, what animals are moving where. Uh, the biologist, the tracker, is telling me um, uh, what, what animals are feeding on. I'm constantly aware of what is happening out there. What is the weather like? Uh, uh, what animals have been eating by their defecations, uh, the browsing, uh, whether or not the animals are in abundance, are they sitting still, are they moving? Where do they water? I'm constantly aware of everything that's going on out here. to the basics again, to the, you know, the, to the cynical, ruthless point, and this is produce the creature. And everything else is all nice, it's interesting, makes life very uh, exciting and so on, but that's about all it does. Morgan has driven to the Canadian border to confer with two men who are chasing Sasquatch through British Columbia, where creature sightings have become commonplace. Rene de Hinden lives here year-round, and has been on Bigfoot's trail for two decades. John Green, author-journalist, has written three books on the subject. Over a picnic table rich with Bigfoot artifacts, the three men discuss their different operating methods. Dahinden and Green both say the creature must be brought in dead or alive. Morgan contends that Sasquatch is too human-like to destroy. Uh, I don't think there's any argument that the fastest way to bring this to legislation for the betterment of the species, the fastest way would be killing one. Um, the only I think that, way. <laughs> possibly. However, the killing of one, how does the... I, I just feel that there... I, I really feel that the youth of this world and the, the people that are young at heart have had enough of the killing. I really feel they have had sufficient of the slaughter of species for the so-called enlightenment of man. But I think that it is time for a new precedent to be set, for legislation to be passed on an accepted species without total uh, so-called scientific knowledge. All right, I, why pick this species? I Are you going to stop not, people from slaughtering hundreds of thousands of deer every Why time? not start now? Why start with this one? Well, uh, I'll tell you why. Mm. It's because it looks more like man than any other, and as far as I'm concerned, that is a concern for humankind, not for any animal kind. You remind you can... me of the little old lady who got all hepped up when I told her um, I will kill a Sasquatch, and then she went in and had a steak dinner. First thing first, and the first thing is to find proof, 100%, so there's unquestionable evidence available which proves the existence of this creature. And the rest of them is all, well, it's nice. You know, you can dream about it and so on, but um, you have to be cynical, you have to be ruthless, and you have, it's, it's no game. It's no game. It's one of the biggest scientific discoveries the world has ever seen. In an anthropological and probably zoological and biological sense, and might revamp or turn over the whole theory of evolution and everything else. But I that would flip our lid, to put a plant lid. But I would rather... So therefore... Uh, you know, never mind the philosophical discussions. Um, I say, go grab them, any which way. I would rather lose than win that way. Well, you know, if you are in this business 20 years, um, 
you haven't got time anymore for, for, um, no, I'm in this to collect the Sasquatch, dead or alive, the proof is its existence, and, you know, that's all there is to it. While Morgan is away, a local resident discovers large impressions practically in the expedition's backyard. Mike Polesnik and Layman Hardy visit the area to see if the tracks will yield other clues. Like a team of detectives, they scour the area, and their efforts pay off. Apparently, something large was walking along this frigid mountain runoff, perhaps to cool off from the heat. And while walking, slipped on a moss-covered rock, leaving several hairs and a large impression in the stream bed. The hair is sent to Mary Jo Flory at her laboratory in Portland for analysis. It will take several weeks for her to determine who or what left it behind. Like sand in a giant hourglass, the melting snows of Mount St. Helens are a constant reminder that summer is slipping away. Near the base of the mountain, Don Blake and Layman Hardy have heard strange sounds. Loud, piercing screams, which they cannot place. Morgan has sent Len Aiken to investigate. They didn't sound like uh, birds, and I couldn't imagine it being a cougar, because it didn't make a noise like uh, the cougars we hear it back home. Uh, and, of course, I don't know all the noises that elks and uh, deer make. It, uh, uh, I know that it's some. too early in the year for elk. Elk will start, you know, in rutting season, it starts about oh, mid-September or October, yeah. so it's it's early for that. What did it resemble? Anything? Or? It was not a human-type scream. Uh, it's it's the type that I've heard uh, chimps make. Hmm. It's sort of a chimp-type scream. And, uh, Completely. I'll go, along, I'll go along with that. It did sound like uh, the kind of noise that you hear a chimpanzee make when, say, you're taking something away from him, you know, a, not an alarm, just more of a... Frustration. Yep. Uh -huh. But it was quite a little distance off. It was probably as much as a quarter of a mile mm. in September. While scouting nearby terrain, Aiken and Blake discover a lava tube cave, one which no human has ever entered. Watch out. Yeah. Getting around the mountains has presented no problem for Blake who has used crutches most of his adult life. The cave is just another challenge. Boy, how an ad opens up. Yeah. Now then, we're losing altitude fast. We're dropping, let's see, five feet for every eight, aren't we? Five Dozens of the caves formed when molten lava gushed through the valleys from a violent Mount St. Helens. The underground tunnels are the longest of their kind in the world and could provide winter shelter or even burial grounds for Sasquatch. Well, places the cave is six feet high, but at five feet six, I have to be careful that I don't break my head somewhere. The end of the galley. No, that on down. It would take several years to explore all the lava tubes, if you could find them all. This cave offers little besides relief from the heat. Well, that's quite a cave there, Lehman. Yeah. You were gone two and a half hours. Coming out. <laughs> Feel that heat just blast you right square in the face as soon as you get to look at that hole. While you were gone, I was reading something roll rocks down from the top of the hill right up here. Hmm. One, there was about five different intervals of it. 
probably 15 or 20 minutes apart. And uh, then there was one time I heard uh, rotten wood move, crash or something. So I don't know whether it was an elk or a bear or some other animal. Whatever, whatever it was, probably no doubt came up another side because this side over here is a little on the steep side. Yeah. At the heat of the sun, though, most anything up there would be under those trees. Yeah. Probably was navigating under the trees. You got, you got more brains than we've got. Could it have been Bigfoot? He's been known to throw rocks at people before. Or could the giant creature turn out to be a giant hoax? Unlikely, in the face of countless reports by people who say they've seen him. People who have nothing to gain by fabricating a story. People like Patty Carter, who as a young girl was befriended by a young Sasquatch. Patty, it was a couple of years ago, uh, I guess when we first met, and you told me rather, I, th I found an intriguing story about what happened to you when you were a child. And I wonder if you'd recount that for me on your first encounter. Well, there was two of them. Big, a big one that was fairly heavy with child, young, whatever. And uh, a young one stood there and looked at me for a while, and then they come down to the creek got a drink, and then they left. Anyway, they come back about every week and got so I'd take them down some venison sausage that I made. And uh, we'd, they'd eat it, and they'd throw sticks and rocks and stuff, play catch with it. With who were you, with you? The young one, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't never, we wouldn't throw at you, would No, you? just to me. Very gentle, underhand-type motion. Very, very gentle. Did you ever throw the, throw it back to him? Uh-huh. And then what would he do? He'd pick it up and throw it back to me again. Like, how long would this go? A couple of hours, like the thing catch was it. The one, the female, it had its baby not too terribly far from me. It's like, oh, about 25, 30 yards, I imagine. Was that in a cave, or was no, it No, it building? was behind the, it was by the creek, by the stump, behind the stump. Behind the stump. Did, mm -hmm. did uh, the creature make any sound? Well, no more so than anything else would give birth to a young one. It hurts. <laughs> and then what did the creature do? Well, it, it wouldn't let me near it at all, near the little one. Mm hmm And, uh, she cleaned it off, and, uh, Picked it up with this way, held it next to her, real close to her. Do you, do you think that these creatures are animals? No, they are not. They're human. If I took a look at these tracks down here good, and they was about six inches wide and about 18 inches and a half long. Sounds crazy, don't it? <laughs> but it's true. What do you think, Annie? What do you think it was? I don't have no idea what it was. But you know something was there? Yeah, I had never heard of Bigfoot at the time. I'm scared to death. Yeah, but we got one hell of an introduction here one night. Let me tell you, we did. The creature is real, very real to folks like Don Autry and his wife Annie, who live down the road from Expedition Headquarters. Big was right through that door out right over there then. And uh, I was laying there and I heard something grow. I raised up on the airborne, I listened to that just for a minute. And I was going, out, what in the hell's going on here? And I hollered, Aunt, from the time I hollered, Aunt, she was standing there in the door. She said, are you a groaning? <laughs> I said, no, hell, I ain't a groaning. And uh, she said, well, they something is. And I got up. You can't, you're going to have to hit me on this a little bit, for I don't remember exactly all that had happened. For I was scared that I got to death. That's <laughs> all he was doing. And, uh, Anyhow, I come out of the bedroom and come in here and I listened to that for it just a minute. And I got an old single shot 22 that I had, just single shots, you know. So I loaded it. Then I went to the bathroom. And while I was in there in the bathroom, remember what that was coming from out of the woods back from about southwest, coming this way here. And, uh, damn, it sounded like he weighed five, six hundred pounds, even more, just really putting his feet down heavy, you know. And, uh, was it moaning at that time? Yeah, moaning all the time. Never quit moaning. 
Anyhow, he come on up to the bathroom wall there, and I stood up in the bathroom floor, and that bathroom at that time was four foot off the ground. And that sound, he was just close to the house, and that sound was coming right straight through the wall, right into, just like this, you know. And then he thrashed all around out here, and I come back in here, and we sat around. What else could you do? We sat there and listened to the thing. And I did. I started to go outside. And I got right along in here. There was another deal out here that I tore off since then. And she grabbed me by the arm. She said, you don't know what you're going out on. And there ain't no damn way you got me outside then. Did you have any feeling? <laughs> did I have any feeling of fear? <laughs> How tight did I squeeze you, huh? I had me. It was the gun. It was squeezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was scared. You betcha. Definitely. I was scared. I logged this country. I've been logging it for 11 years, and I've never seen nothing. I've never seen a footprint until this. I just walked right upon it right here at the house. And it wasn't a prank. It wasn't a prank. That wasn't a prank. For a man, it had to been over eight foot tall to make tracks in that snow like this down here. And I don't know nobody that big. And I was born and raised in the woods. I've killed bear, helped kill elk, deer, everything. And I've never heard nothing like this. Gracious ease of them glory. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy they bring to me. How I long once more to be with my friends at the country church. And the reports continue, each similar to the one before, except for place and time. Too many reports from too many people for a hoax to be considered. I believe that this could be a possible area for him. There's no roads here. There's no roar of the logging trucks. There's no shooting. There's no people chattering about. He can walk around here at ease because nobody comes in here. Despite warnings not to go, Morgan and Polesnik returned to the untamed area the tracker explored earlier in the summer. Even with the introduction of four-wheel drive vehicles and snowmobiles, this American frontier has been unwilling to yield to man. The pair has food for seven days. The snakes are everywhere.
Did you give him back the map last night? Back up in the side pocket. Hope we don't have to go over that. You see how sheer it was on the far side? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Straight up. If we can get it. Follow this along. I don't I don't want to go high if it's not necessary yet. Ever since 1970, I've been following areas, finding uh, tracks, feces, and all this jazz coming down through this area. And it's just recently come into a, what I think is a movement pattern. And what our objective is, is to go entirely through on the north fork of this this creek up to Mount Mitchell. And it's my understanding that not too many people have ever done this. And uh, as you know, the dire warnings that we have received that uh, people go in and they don't come out. But in any case, this is the flow line coming down through here, and it's a natural, it's a natural walkway. It's very hidden. So far, it's been pretty rough. I don't know what it's going to be like when we get deep down into the ravine. Well, I don't know. I just, you know, when you stand up on a cliff side and look over this valley, it's one thing. When you get down here, it's something else. I sure agree. And we'll find out. Well, Bob, I sure could have had a better choice of people to go out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> So far, the only passable way through this wilderness is along the riverbed. The water is icy, the algae-covered rocks treacherous. On the second day, despite their pleas, Morgan orders the camera crew to stay behind. The rest of the journey is too risky. Others who have challenged the river beyond this point have never returned. heat has driven Elizabeth Mormon to seek refuge under nature's own shower.
Frontier Bomb. For Morgan and Polesnik, the trip through the river valley has been arduous and frustrating. Okay. A bad fall has left Morgan with several bruised ribs. On more than one occasion, they felt they were being followed. Whether it was a bear, cougar, or some other creature, they could not be certain. The journey has affected them both physically and emotionally. The experience, they say, has been like a tribal initiation into manhood. They have been baptized by the forest, but still no Sasquatch. And I've been warned time and again not to go into this area because a lot of people have been, have gone in and haven't come out. Well, like anything else, you, you go in and find out why. Find out for yourself, then you know. It's not a matter of someone telling you. And we discovered that coming up along that river, for instance, it was like stepping back in a time machine. I think I've seen what this country must have looked like perhaps thousands upon thousands of years ago. Coming up over the top of that ridge, we found an area where berries are, are so abundant that we literally ate our way over the mountain. But when we crested that ridge and started down in this area, for the past few miles, the area took on another character. It took on a forbidding, foreboding aura. And I knew, I just knew damn well we weren't welcome. And literally, every step of the way, Mike and I, you just know, you know, you, if you make a mistake, there's no way in the hell you're gonna come out. But you know what? It, it gave us a new awareness, a new respect for wildlife because the deer and the elk and the bear, they live with it every day. But I am convinced, and I welcome anyone that is a skeptic on it to come along with me. I'm convinced that this area, there's no problem whatsoever for a creature like Bigfoot to live in almost a Garden of Eden without any worries about man. There's very few men ever enter this area. those hairs that you sent out to the lab about a month ago? Yeah, yeah. I finally got a report back from the director of the lab on those. And he feels that those are human body hair from the lower extremities. From the lower extremities? Of course, mm. it doesn't confirm absolutely, but it certainly is highly indicative. Well, the circumstances under which they were found, you know, is very well documented. And I think the chances of that being homo sapien is very, very remote. Well, I am inclined to agree with you. Thanks for making this a very good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <sighs> I'll be damned. August sizzles on. Logging is temporarily halted on orders from the Forestry Service. The extreme fire danger has made logging too risky. The town of Cougar, which mirrors the lumber industry, becomes deserted. Day after day, the temperature touches 100 degrees. Morgan is warned the forests may be closed to everyone, including his researchers. But for now, the expedition is allowed to continue. Still, no rain in sight. What I saw, Bob, was uh, located on the far right side of that mass of trees. 
It was large enough for me to see with the unaided eye. John Crowder has seen something he can't identify on a ledge near the snow line of Mount St. Helens. A strange sense of fear had invaded his camp shortly before the sighting. It was a feeling no one could explain, like so many other things this summer. Big enough to see. Well, you know of the gray Bigfoot that's uh, been reported in this area, but also I think we should be aware that there are, I believe, mountain goat up in this area. There's only one thing to do, and that's survey the ledge close up. Morgan and the others have made this climb many times before on another mountain at another place in the forest. Morgan has become weary from the endless climbs and dead-end trails, but any feeling of fatigue he may have is no match for his unrelenting drive to find the Sasquatch. He's so close now, he feels nothing will stop him. All the signs are there, the tracks, screams, reports from loggers and residents. Morgan is convinced he's located a movement route for at least one family of Bigfoot. A movement route that goes straight through Ape Canyon. Named that in the 1920s, when a group of prospectors were attacked by vicious, hairy apes. Ape Canyon is just beyond where John Crowder saw something large and gray. There's little relief from the scorching heat. And at this altitude, the thinner oxygen adds to the physical stress of the climbers. It's hard to describe the frustrations of having made the climb and finding little more than scuff marks. Morgan knows time is running against him. I think that next to close-mindedness, I think time is our greatest enemy. Most definitely time. The lumber industry is cutting into the forest. Man is moving in more on his snowmobiles and his trail bikes, his four-wheel drive vehicles. The Bigfoot has to retreat. So we're running a race against time. Very definitely, it's a very pressing, a very, very frightening thing, time. They start down in silence, hoping to reach their vehicles before sunset. But the day is not over. What do you think, Bob? It's old stuff. It has a lot of clean edges. Well, it's hominid, bipedal. And what does that thing measure again? Oh, roughly 13 to 14. And there's been a lot of washing here on the width, but well, it would go at least six at the widest, widest point. Well, it's, it's not where a few rocks laid no, and, no. and rolled away. We've seen enough of that up here. Add another, add another mystery. August passes the sun to September, but the forest has had enough. A small fire breaks out not far from the main logging road, but a safe distance from the expedition camps. Firefighting teams are on the scene quickly, and the forestry service is encouraged by a general stillness of the wind. Morgan keeps in touch with the fire's progress. The fire burns into the night. And the next morning, through self-generating winds, it begins to burn more rapidly. More acres are threatened. The Forestry Service calls for help, and the small band of firefighters turns into a sizable camp. Despite the efforts of 600 people fighting the inferno, 
the fire goes over the hill and into Ape Canyon. Morgan is distressed as the fire spreads quickly through the canyon. All the evidence of Sasquatch in the area has led directly to this place. He surveys the situation with Sam Melville, star of the Rookies television series, who's visiting for a few days. people out of their base camps or out of their their camps yeah it's possible i warned uh, the, the two biologists you know they're right over the ridge they're right over the top and this will alter elizabeth going back into the lake it's just a flat block for for a movement i'm afraid with all these people look at look at the hundreds of people that are going to be in this area fighting a fire they're going to be running up and down airplanes over do you think a shy creature is going to come within all our waiting and all our planning and our whole damn concept was locked along that one route. And there's not. He may take he may take the western route, may come around here, God only knows. But see so what we've been banking on, you know. The last several years is gathering information along this one route. And and now, with this cut in the middle right now, I don't, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know wh how it'll affect the, the movement patterns. I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's a factor that I hadn't... I not counted on, for sure. It's the end of the road for this particular expedition. There's little doubt the fire and the hundreds of people fighting it will lead the Bigfoot to an alternate route. But for Robert Morgan, it's far from the end of the road. He'll be back next year, and the year after, and the year after that. He'll be back for however long it takes him to satisfy the world. But we are merely men among the giants.